electronically or via internet by utilizing the web link or dial in information printed on this agenda. Instructions on how to make a public comment during the meeting. At points in the meeting, when the meeting chair requests public comment, members of the public participating in the live meeting, either via internet or telephone, shall indicate their desire to speak. If participating via internet, please click the raise hand feature located within the Zoom application screen. If connected via telephone, please dial star nine. All public comments shall be addressed to the board of directors and limited to three minutes per speaker. The board of directors may choose to respond to comments or request staff to respond at the conclusion of the public comment. All right, so moving on to the agenda. Does anyone on the board have any changes or deletions to the agenda? All right, I'm seeing a lot of head shakes, so that means no. Um, so we will consider the agenda adopted. Moving on to the consent calendar. Does anyone on the board um, have any questions or comments or concerns about the consent calendar? No, but we do public comment for oh, the get public, public comment on the adoption. Any public comment on adoption? Uh, yeah, one second. Hi. Uh, yeah, it's just really a quick comment. Um, you know, every uh, meeting we have uh, agenda items that we would like to uh, talk about. And, you know, lo and behold, there's really nothing on the agenda tonight. I'm not even sure, you know, almost there's no point in meeting. Um, seems odd. And uh, maybe you guys can address this later in the meeting. But uh, that's the only comment I have. Thanks. Thanks for your comment, Stephen. Um, all right. And we do have a light agenda this, this month. Um, so moving on to the consent calendar. Does anyone on the board have any questions or comments regarding the consent calendar? Move to adopt the consent calendar. Okay. I'll second that. Awesome. Thank you. Um, any comments from the public? I do not have any hands raised on the consent calendar. All right. Then shall we have a vote? Board President Ruggieri. Aye. Director Case. Aye. Director Kilkenny. Aye. Director Oiserman. Aye. Director Shea. Yes. Thanks. Well, thank you. Item D, public co comment open for open time for items not on the agenda. Any public comment? Yeah. One second, please. Stephen. Yeah. Uh, before I start, I want to congratulate Bill on uh, seeing another another uh, 12 kids. <laughs> Happy birthday, Bill. And, Thanks, Stephen. Um, and anyone else who's had a birthday in this last month. Uh, uh, it's I think it's about what uh, 18 months that you, you guys have been on the board, uh, the the new three members, and uh, of course uh, for the older uh, board members, it's been uh, a lot longer. And you know the question I just ask is, you know, how how are you doing? How is the vision uh, that you uh, have about the future of our community? How's it working out? Um, I see a, a community that is. Uh, uh, more beautiful and more friendly and more accessible, uh, great recreation programs, excellent fire services, and uh, a stellar open space. And part of that is in the future. And I hope uh, you'll join me uh, and others in actualizing that vision. To get there, we need to have goals. We need to have uh, a common passion, and we need to work together. I guess this is not much different than what I've been saying all along, but um, you not only represent yourself, but you also represent the community. Uh, when I spoke to the Park and Recreation com uh, Committee earlier this month, uh, I said, uh, you know, I think it's time to start thinking in terms of user groups in our community. We have different populations uh, with different needs, and um, I think we need to understand how well we're addressing those needs, just like a, a good business might. Uh, you know, I, I, we do great for the kids, and I am absolutely thrilled at what I'm seeing over there uh, in the summer camps. It's just fabulous to see all those kids having fun and the pool area and whatnot. But we have an even greater community and an even greater needs. I was over uh, sitting in Quietwood Grove or Fireman's Picnic area uh, today, and I'm looking at the tables, and you've got graffiti, you've got broken boards, and it doesn't look like that area has been raked or really any kind of attention paid to it. Of course, the water fountain's still broken. And I don't know how it, it gets overlooked, uh, but uh, I would hope that you would uh, uh, start addressing the full scope of, of uh, the Marine Wood CSD. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. Appreciate the thoughtful comments. Um, moving on to district matters and the district manager report. Eric? Yep, uh, just a couple uh, key kind of things here to update you on, and I've got updates since the time that this was written, so we'll just kind of take them one at a time uh, and field any questions the board might have on each of these top few topics. Uh, in terms of the maintenance facility courtyard, uh, as I put in here, we did execute an agreement with uh, Master Construction. The agreement at this point in time was for the base bid uh, amount as we work through some value engineering opportunities on both the courtyards. We have met on site a few times, most recently, even today. Uh, by the end of the week, I kind of uh, am expecting a bit of a revised schedule of values coming from the contractor, so we'll have a better sense on uh, what types of uh, cost impacts we, we can achieve through some of these value engineering opportunities. Um, and then by, I would say, next week, I do expect them uh, to actually start moving equipment into site and you start really uh, breaking ground and getting everything done. So we're still on schedule. Um, it just takes a while to get things like contracts and bonds and everything else put together, but we are doing good. Been very communicative with the builder. Uh, I'm very happy he's working on this project. Um, and again, you know, just to kind of reiterate on the scope of this project, because it's much more than just simply building a fence. I mean, there's a lot of grading, there's a lot of, of uh, drainage that has to come into play, there's some earth movement that has to happen, there is uh, foundation walls that have to be built, uh, retaining walls. So, you know, this is still a large scope and this, you know, ties in directly to the larger building. So it becomes an extension of that building. It's not just simply uh, wrapping a fence around things. Um, that said, I'm happy with where we're at. I'm happy with working with them. Um, if Luke has anything else that he would like to add to that, he's certainly welcome to as well. Um, otherwise, if there's any specific questions on what's going on here, um, I'm happy to answer those. Like I said, I think we should have a better sense of uh, ultimate project cost here uh, as we uh, are able to kind of work through some of these things and questions and they're out there staking and getting things together and coming up with ideas. And as we settle on those, then you'll be able to provide us updated cost impacts on this. Okay. Luke, did you want to add anything? Um, I just um, was able to attend uh, briefly a part of the meeting today, and I just want to say I'm very encouraged in the direction things are going um, for, this, for the courtyard project. And uh, I think that we've established a really good rapport with um, that, that company, and um, I think that, uh, yeah, I think that things are moving in the right direction. So I'm excited to see what takes place over the next couple months. 
it's great. Well, I appreciate the, the work that you that, there that you've been doing on this, um, and, and, and Luke as well. And I also appreciate the value engineering discussions that you're having. Um, any comments or questions from the board? I was just curious, just kind of out of the loop from missing last meeting. Um, your final comments on this, Eric, is project is on target to be completed by the end of September. Is that right. just the Western courtyard, or is that going to be both courtyards? The whole kit and caboodle. Nice. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you very much. Yeah. The other thing we discussed last month, Chris, was we were going to take uh, any of these extra costs out of your board stipend, since you were the one who wasn't here for that meeting uh, to apply Perfect. for the project. Perfect. Okay, shoot. Yeah. No, uh, and that was, yeah. figure out how to take nothing for nothing, but he's a tax guy, so he knows how that works. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, yeah, and that was the other thing I was going to close with is yes, we are on schedule, and it's the complete project uh, by the end of the uh, by the end of September. Um, uh, interesting update on the Miller Creek Trail. So just to kind of clarify, I know the wording that I put here, especially as I reread it, is a little bit tricky. Um, as you recall, you know this whole thing stems from uh, an, a, a land use subdivision agreement that dates back to 2006, which contained a kind of a rough description of a proposed trail to go through the general area stretching from Las Colinas Avenue uh, east to uh, what's going to be an extension of Marinwood Avenue. Um, when we originally went out to kind of scope that, we realized relatively quickly that it just was not a practical area to build a trail, and especially not the trail that was described. That was why we brought in Tim Best to kind of perform the trail feasibility report, and he actually uh, produced a few trail options, one uh, which is the preferred and the only one at all recommended by staff uh, that has a trail cost of $274,000 uh, estimate to construct. So when we uh, took this information back to Robert Eves and kind of started talking, who is the developer of the senior living uh, center, the proposed senior living center, and talking about what we were going uh, what we were looking to do and what would be a reasonable financial contribution, we kind of came to a determination that it would make sense to produce one more cost estimate on what it would cost to actually build the trail as described in that 2006 agreement, since technically that is what they are uh, obligated to. So we did that. Um, and once again, went back through Tim Best. Uh, one interesting note in that 2006 agreement is it actually calls for two trails. Uh, one is going along the creek and one is going up the steep hillside um, to the top of the hill right there, if you recall uh, when I set that out several months ago now. And, uh, and we all you know, kind of quickly came to the realization that uh, you know, building a trail up that hillside was not feasible uh, or, or desired it would lead to a lot of erosion problems. And, uh, and we kind of decided we're just looking at the creekside trail. Well, Tim went ahead and put together the estimate for both. Anyway, um, the numbers that I listed in my report are actually strictly just for the uh, for the Creekside Trail, um, with uh, the 115 kind of being the subtotal, but he added a 25% contingency. Um, well, the subtotal on the Ridge Trail uh, was another 44,000, so that brings you, you know, just below around 159,000 dollars. In uh, talking back with Robert Eves, he has said that you know they, his firm is prepared to uh, to contribute an amount in, in to contribute in an amount equal to the uh, construction subtotals of both of these. So you're looking at about closer to about 150,000 dollars, which in my mind I think is an incredibly um, generous and significant contribution towards this overall project for something that is written in an agreement to uh, cost you know purportedly 30,000 um, dollars. Remembering again, he's not the original on this. He actually uh, bought out the development rights to this uh, senior living facility. Um, so I have sent that back to him. I, I said, I appreciate you uh, working with us on this. What I have done is I forwarded this information to our legal counsel at the county council's office, and I've asked if they could draft up an agreement uh, to put in place between our agency and the developer that kind of states the financial terms of their contribution. Everything would be contingent upon if the district did indeed actually construct this trail. So you're still looking at, um, in all honesty, probably another you know, $150,000 that the district would need to come up with uh, once you start getting into grading permitting um, and then any signage and other things that we might want to have to do along the way. Uh, you have to do biological studies, things like that. So um, I think ultimately he's looking at uh, you know, contributing approximately half of what is a much larger, much more significant trail project than what was originally described in, in his 2006 agreement. Um, again, I think that's an incredible win for the district. I think that the district, uh, should the board want to continue to pursue this, it would be good to have this in a formalized agreement um, with the developer, um, but then to also start searching for other potential funding opportunities, I, which I think we would be very competitive for. And I think that we already have a, a large match amount to put towards some of these things and grant funding opportunities like to know that the agencies they're funding are contributing large uh, towards the projects as well. Um, and speaking with John Campo, who's a senior resources planner for Marin County Open Space District and also on our um, Park and Rec Commission, he has volunteered his time to help do a lot of this research and really kind of take on a bit of a project management role for this entire project. So I think throughout the course of this, it's taken a while to kind of get to this point, but uh, I can tell you personally, I think that this is a more significant contribution from the developer than I was originally anticipating to be reasonable or realistic. And the fact that he kind of came back after looking at this report and said, we're prepared to contribute the amount of due to do both of these trails, I thought was just uh, more than reasonable on his end. So that's my personal opinion. Um, obviously, uh, looking for any questions or thoughts the board might have on this, but I think if you can get half of this project uh, basically funded through this developer, that's a, that's a huge win for us. And it'll be a, a trail that will be built properly, go through the right areas, require very lo little future maintenance, uh, and, and be there for generations to come. Yeah. Yeah. We have to approve the project before we can apply for grants. Um, not necessarily. Um, you know, you, giving direction to us is fine. You're not, I don't think, quite at a point to uh, necessarily approve, or we're not committing. We're going to keep moving forward, and we're going to keep doing this. Uh, I think that there's no harm in entering into a formal agreement with the developer that says, you know, should the district continue to pursue this, then they will at that time um, contribute this financial amount towards it. I think, you know, once once you have a project in hand, uh, there's nothing necessarily that needs to be approved at this point in time. Some grants call for a resolution, like the playground grant that we're working uh, with right now, call for a resolution of the board. Well, when that time comes, the resolution will be um, presented. Correct. So my question is, is in order to commit to this project, or in order to get funding, do we have to commit to this project? Um, well, sure, because the funding would be project specific. Uh, but no. we don't need to do that at this point in time. I think let's see no, what no, opportunities are out there, and then we'll bring that information that. back. So, so it's a kind of a chicken egg question, right? So do we, like, right? do we have to commit to this? And if we don't get the grants, does it have to come out of our budget? And do we have to move forward with it? No. No, you do not. Um, I, I think we would continue to move forward with the hope that we can find other supplemental funding towards this project. Uh, yes. Now, if that funding doesn't exist, and I bring it back to the board and I say, we, we're not able to get any grants, our time is coming to a close, is the board have an appetite to commit $150,000 towards this project would be a conversation at that point in time, but you don't have to commit to that at this point in time simply for us to research or even start applying for grants. Okay. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. It does. I just feel like I'm the outsider on this trail, so that's why. We'll invite um, you for the first hike, though. Huh? We'll invite you for the first hike. Yeah. <clears throat> have a ribbon cutting ceremony.
um, that amount of money, but then maybe there's a statement about, you know, what, what's to say if this takes 10 more years to build, that we would also build in the inflationary piece to it. That's an interesting point, Chris, and that actually came up at the Park and Rec meeting. I think yeah. at this point in time, uh, once there, there's one, there's a clause within the 2006 agreement that basically states the trail construction will start when the bridge and the road construction uh, has happened. So I think at that point, you can't necessarily put it on, in my opinion, if it takes us five years longer to commit to this, I don't see how you can hold that against the developer per se. I think that's a risk that we take and they're ready. They're ready to contribute. The conditions have been met. Here's the financial contribution. And if we don't want to do it for another five years and we say, okay, well, we're going to wait five years and then it's going to cost you another $50,000 instead. Um, if what I'm saying is making sense as opposed to he's got the contribution, the delay would not be on their end. I think it's fair that this is ratcheted up so much because the delay has entirely been on them since 2006. He is now saying, I'm ready to contribute. We have a timeline for when we expect this road. He's hoping to get that bridge and road work done before they shut down that kind of work, which is generally mid-October. Otherwise, he has to wait till spring due to environmental regulations before he can do any of that kind of work. Is that and what so, all the work is that's going on right now? No, the work that's going on down there right now has to do with the excavation of uh, Marinewood Plaza. It has oh, okay. nothing to do with, uh, with the senior living facility project. Okay. Um, so I guess to answer your question, Chris, by making sense, they're basically at a point where they're ready for us to go. So any further delay from this point would actually be on the district's part, not on the developer's part. So I, I don't know how reasonable it is to go back and say, well, we need three more years and there's going to be some inflation in those three years when you say, I'm ready now. Right. No, that, that makes, I understand what you're saying for sure. I guess, I guess maybe then the, the addendum that I would want is if for some reason they have to delay the project, which we, we, over the last few years, we've definitely seen you know, reasons outside of anybody's control the projects are delayed, and then that affects the, the bottom line cost. That's actually a very good point, Chris, and I will certainly uh, bring that up with legal when they draft something up too that just says, should it be, you know, should construction of the roadway or the bridge or anything be delayed, thus delaying the trail construction, uh, revised estimates will be taken at that time. For, for me, that would be excellent. I don't know how everybody else feels, but I, I would like that. I think it's a great suggestion. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Bill, your hand is up. Yes. Uh, out of curiosity, since you brought up the uh, bridge and road construction, and if they're not done by October, they're going to move into spring, does that mean there's going to be movement in the next month or so? That was their original, when he sent the letter that I'd actually included in a board packet a meeting or two ago, uh, that was the timeline that they were on, was to be able to get this done before they shut down that work, which I want to say is generally around August 15th, and that kind of comes from um, the Army Corps of Engineers as well as the California Fish and Game for Fish and Wildlife. Because that's going to be kind of a large project that could take a few months. Yeah, the bigger part of that project is getting the bridge done. From yeah. there, um, the roadway I don't think is quite as impacted, but they can't get the roadway done until the bridge is done. That's it. <laughs> so we could get the go-ahead, uh, it would be probably next spring to start the trail building. If um, we can get some grant movement. You, you could. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and then, you know, the other thing to keep in mind, and this is still, you know, just kind of looking at it from a big picture, and, you know, this is still in no way, shape, or form guaranteed to happen, um, but, you know, Marinwood Plaza is part of the housing element uh, sites for potential additional housing. So you're also looking at, you know, a slew of additional residents beyond just the senior facility that could be living, you know, within steps of the other end of this trail. I his time and efforts to help us pursue these. So uh, uh, we just, you know, we haven't really started moving forward. We're waiting to kind of get all of the information in place. Uh, with a senior living facility project. Okay. Uh, so I guess to answer your question, Chris, by making sense, they're basically at a point where they're ready for us to go. So any further delay from this point would actually be on the district's part, not on the developer's part. So I, I don't know how reasonable it is to go back and say, well, we need three more years and there's going to be some inflation in those three years when you say, I'm ready now. Right. No, that, that makes, I understand what you're saying for sure. I guess, I guess maybe then the, the addendum that I would want is if for some reason they have to delay the project, which okay. we, we, over the last few years, we've definitely seen, you know, reasons outside of anybody's control that projects are delayed and then that affects the, the bottom line cost. That's actually a very good point, Chris. And I will certainly uh, bring that up with legal when they draft something up too that just says, should it be, you know, should construction of the roadway or the bridge or anything be delayed, thus delaying the trail construction, uh, revised estimates will be taken that time. For, for me, that would be excellent. I don't know how everybody else feels, but I, I would like that. I think it's a great suggestion. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Bill, your hand is up. Yes. Uh, out of curiosity, since you brought up the uh, bridge and road construction, and if they're not done by October, they're going to move into spring. Does that mean there's going to be movement in the next month or so? That was their original, when he sent the letter that I'd actually included in a board packet a meeting or two ago, uh, that was the timeline that they were on, was to be able to get this done before they shut down that work, which I want to say is generally around August 15th, and that kind of comes from um, the Army Corps of Engineers as well as the California Fish and Game for Fish and Wildlife. Because that's going to be kind of a large project. That could take a few months. Yeah, the bigger part of that project is getting the bridge done. From yeah. there, um, the roadway I don't think is quite as impacted, but they can't get the roadway done until the bridge is done. That's it. <laughs> so we could get the go-ahead, uh, it would be probably next spring to start the trail building, um, if we can get some grant movement. You, you could. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and then, you know, the other thing to keep in mind, and this is still, you know, just kind of looking at it from a big picture, and, you know, this is still in no way, shape, or form guaranteed to happen, um, but, you know, Marinwood Plaza is part of the housing element uh, sites for potential additional housing, so you're also looking at, you know, a slew of additional residents beyond just the senior facility that could be living, you know, within steps of the other end of this trail, so uh, I, I just, you know, the trail, I think, would be a popular trail, not only just for people who want to take a leisurely walk, but you'll have a lot of school-age children that can use this trail to get to the middle school, uh, can use this trail to come to the community center in Marinwood Park without having to kind of walk along the sidewalks of busy streets, you just have to cross one street, and you're on your way. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. Some of my question was answered. So definitely we have to wait until the road is built for us to, to start our work. We can start looking for funding and getting that going and just basically have it on standby. Uh, yeah, we can certainly start looking for funding. You know, uh, the one clause with a lot of these types of funding opportunities is they have, uh, you know, deadlines and project completion deadlines. So we just have to keep that in mind. But a lot of these types of fundings actually are usually annual or biannual events, not like one-time funding events. And this is where I'm going to lean heavily on John Campo because finding every avenue of funding source for these types right. of projects uh, is a key part of his job. And he's again volunteered his time and efforts to help us pursue these. So uh, uh, we just, you know, we haven't really started moving forward. We're waiting to kind of get all of the information in place, uh, just in terms of the financial contribution on the other end and timing. Okay. I, you know, I do kind of agree with what Bill's saying to some point that they haven't really started to break ground yet on getting that bridge done and, and worked. Um, three months from now to have it completed is uh, tricky, but I don't know. Okay. He's also not hamstrung by uh, the various government codes that make projects take three times as long as the private industry gets them done. Okay, thank
Okay. I, you just brought up an interesting, I think, um, little twist to this whole thing. If this becomes a, you know, I, I will stop stop from calling it a thoroughfare, but if it becomes a, a major pathway for the kids to, you know, to cut, to, let's say, the middle schoolers to get to Miller Creek and things like that, um, there's part of me that wonders, do we, like, should we be thinking about making this an all all seasons type of pathway um, that, you know, obviously that would cost a lot more, but maybe as the as the other developers get into play with the housing, um, it would be interesting to see if there was a connection there. Um, uh, well, I'm not 100% sure I understand. I think what I'm just, what I'm, I'm, I'm having just been on, uh, I was just in, in, Incline, and they, they built, if anybody hasn't been on the Impossible Trail um, from Incline to Sand Harbor, do yourself a favor and do it. It bridges over the, the banks of Lake Tahoe. I mean, it's amazing, but it is, in that sense, it's, you know, it's paved, it's a little bit wider um, and will allow access for bikers um, all throughout the year, as opposed to what we would have now, which is, you know, probably more three seasons in our neighborhood. Um, definitely not something I'm saying we'd like need to go any further on right now, but it's, if something happens before we start this building, building our trail, we might want to think about that. Well, yeah, I think you'd be entering into an entirely different type of project, and I think you would quickly be into a seven-figure project and above, um, potentially eight, not to mention, I don't even know if you could get the proper permitting for that, because you're talking about putting impervious surfaces through a, a watershed. Um, I don't mean to poo-poo your idea here, Chris. I, I just oh, no, think don't it, it, it might be a little grand. Um, but I, I do want to I might just start spinning on stuff that, that you know, starts to help the community in ways that I hadn't originally anticipated. Yeah. But um, all I'm saying is, if for some reason this gets pushed, and housing starts coming in and really being planned in a developer for there, I think that's, you know, a, a quick step that we could perhaps take a look at. But I don't need to extend tonight's meeting on that. I'm just, I'm just dreaming. Yeah, well, I will say, uh, just to kind of, uh, this trail that, w the only trail staff's recommending and the one that's designed, I mean, this is essentially an all-season trail. This is a high, high quality, high construction bid, low grading, um, you know, slopes not to exceed, you know, 8% or 10% or whatever the uh, best practice standards are. So outside of an actual rainy day, I think that this trail would be as accessible all year long as any trail. And that's why we picked this one. Right. And this cost, I mean, the cost point was much larger, but that's literally why we picked it, was that we anticipated that it would be very highly used and we wanted to make sure it was as safe as possible and could withstand as much as possible. Totally. I'm all in. No worries. Awesome. Well, appreciate the dialogue. Um, any, anything from the public? Uh, yep. One second. Steven. My computer crashed again. I don't know what, what it is about these meetings, but it, the last two Zoom meetings, I've, uh, my computer's crashed. Um, the, uh, with regards to the trail, um, I think it would be helpful to think in terms of sections of the trail. There's some sections that are going to need a bunch of work, retaining walls, um, grading, but the other the rest of it is going to be more or less a standard trail and uh, will not be complicated. I, my, my estimate is at least three quarters of the distance is, is not anything special as far as construction needs go. Um, that said, I think it, I, I do like the idea that, yeah, let's make it passable by people as well as bicycles. So we want a, something along the lines of what's in Marinwood Park um, uh, in the dog leg section. Um, I think that would be great. Um, I did some back of the envelope uh, calculations on uh, the fence project that you approved for $258,000. And uh, there's 91 feet, I think, uh, if I added that up correctly from the drawings, 91 linear feet. And this is how um, fences are uh, bid out. And we're paying uh, $2,800 per linear foot. Of course, that figure also includes the grading and some other stuff, but if you're just looking at the cost of the fence, we've got a gold-plated fence surrounded a gold, surrounding a gold-plated uh, maintenance shed, and it's actually kind of stunning. Um, I did look at some calculations for metal fencing um, that you typically see, uh, like the wrought iron fencing that you typically see in facilities like this, and it runs from $100 to $300 per linear foot. So we're paying a huge premium for this uh, fence, which, by the way, by its design with horizontal slats, will be very easily scalable and not very secure. Might look nice, um, but we're paying a whole lot for it. And it's a shame because if we were to have uh, a different design, we would have enough money for the Miller Creek Trail uh, as well with the funding that we have set aside. This, we're just spending, 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 and it's just unbelievable to me. Um, I don't see how we achieve anything in this district if we don't have a little bit better fiscal uh, discipline in these projects. Um, it is uh, not an area of expertise for our business manager, uh, but a, uh, a manager who has practical experience in this area would be able to determine uh, how to best utilize our funding. Um, right, I, have more to, I have more to say later. I, I apologize for running on. Awesome. Thank you, Stephen. Um, all right, then, moving on to Fire Department Matters. Draft minutes of Fire Commission meeting review. Director Bill Kenny. This one was the shortest meeting that I've ever been to <laughs> because she quite wasn't there. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm just kidding. There really wasn't much that we went over, um, so I, won't, I don't have that much to report back. Can I, can I chime in here? Um, one of the things that did come up uh, a discussion for potential future agenda items um, was the possibility of actually moving um, from having monthly commission meetings to bi-monthly commission meetings uh, with right. the notion that we could have, uh, you know, in those off months, always look at um, calling a special meeting if there's initiatives or things that also need to be discussed. I think uh, to Kathleen's point, you know, not every meeting has a, a, a lot to discuss. Um, further, uh, you know, getting people to commit to monthly uh, versus bi-monthly might be easier on the bi-monthly end as we're trying to recruit other commissioners. So I uh, wanted to kind of take a little bit of a temperature of the, of the board on that and then said we'd report back to the commission uh, with their next meeting. So do you guys care if the fire commission meets every other month or every month? I mean, it's been monthly for as long as I've been on the board. Um, I do know there's very light months that not much is discussed. And I mean, I'm okay with it if, as long as- Which one? With just doing bi-monthly. As long as um, the commissioners and our firefighters and our chief says that it's okay that they feel like we're addressing their needs, um, then I think it's a great idea. I would agree with Savon. If, if the commission and the firefighters think this is a reasonable idea, I don't see why we would disagree. Yeah. And, then, and then of course, you know, if there's, if there's material to, to, to require meetings more frequently, then you have the discretion to, to change that, right? You can, always call, you can always call a special meeting in between the regular meetings. Mm -hmm. 
so I don't see any issue. It was an incident or something that we had to review. It was presented to me every other month on calendar and then with a special request. Yeah. Do they need the two week notice also, just like we do, Eric? I'm just asking. A, a two week notice? Two for... week? Wait, so 10 days, sorry, 10 days. You know, the week, like the notice. 72, like, 72, 72 hours. hours, sorry. <laughs> yes, that's all. It's I a, am not having a good day here. Sorry, it's subject to the Brown Act. I have some thoughts, but I'll let uh, Bill speak first. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, bi monthly. There's not a lot going on with the fire commission, not really. Uh, during the year, there's a few meetings that need to be done. I agree. I think that's as long as everyone agrees to it, that's that's good. The uh, fire department is the main crux where that goes. But to my mind, I, I noticed uh, the eucalyptus trees in the median have been brought up over and over and over and over again. And it's like there's never going to be a resolution to satisfy Tom's bringing it up. And I'm wondering why bother? Why we address it each time? It, it's pointless. Well, uh, there's a lot of because it's the county that has to do something to that. And the Correct. county's never going to take those down unless there's a fire there. Correct. But it doesn't mean that he can't bring it up just like. I know, but it's it's again kind of a useless waste of. Air talking. Correct. So we won't meet. Is there a reason why we're discussing the topics at the fire commission meeting? Well, yeah. it was on the fire commission minutes. Okay, got it. Okay, sorry. Yeah. So then uh, they'll on the minutes every... almost every month. Got it. Well, then they'll be on the minutes every other month. That's <laughs> like. Uh, can I ask if Chief White has any thoughts on the commission going to bi monthly as opposed to monthly? Good evening, directors and uh, district manager directors. And I actually, um, I think. Uh, if the commission themselves have asked for this, uh, obviously they see probably less value in meeting monthly. Uh, I certainly think we can build enough content for a bi-monthly meeting without a, a challenge. Um, there are months when things are, are not as full um, for one reason or another, but I, I certainly don't see any problem with doing it on a bi-monthly basis. And I think the caveat was, if there's something that, that arises that we need to meet on, we still have the ability to do so. So I, I certainly can support that. Okay. Um, the way that this would happen from a technical standpoint is we'll bring this back as a formal agenda item to the commission at their next meeting. It would require a bylaws amendment because the meeting schedule is written into the fire commission bylaws. Um, and if they approve to recommend that, it would come back to the board at your next meeting for formal approval to amend the fire commission bylaws because the board is the authority for that. Uh, and then for the record, what, what kind of got discussed would be moving to uh, every even month, which also kind of uh, gets rid of some holiday conflicts um, with the very beginning of January, a lot of times right around the 4th of July or holiday conflicts. So moving to the even months uh, has fewer conflicting dates that would be involved as well. And it wouldn't be replaced, like we'd still get Chief's wife report in this meeting every month. So it's, realistically, it's not like if they have questions, they can't attend this one on the odd months. Correct. If they wanted to. Yeah, and they get notified of all the agenda packets to go out to. Uh, okay, well, we can move forward on that then. Uh, and it'll be a, a formal topic on the next uh, uh, commission, meeting. commission meeting with a report on how the, this what the board had to say about it. And then it'll come back to this board for any formal action uh, at your next meeting. Thank you. Um, any public comment on the draft minutes? Uh, yeah, one second. Steven. Well, I'm glad you had a quick meeting. Um, I'd like to remind everybody that the fire department is responsible for spending half of our budget in the district, or actually more, I think. And um, I honestly, I well, I, I hate meetings that have no point to them. Um, it sounded like the last meeting didn't get a lot, lot done. I do think uh, having that touchstone, regular touchstone, is uh, good not only for uh, the fire department but for the community at large. And so I would, uh, I mean, if someone can't spend you know 26 minutes in once a month, you know, to this, maybe they shouldn't be serving on the board, um, or maybe we should think of a different way to to get the function done. Um, but but I, it's, it's kind of frustrating. Um, at the last CSD meeting, my, my good friend, uh, well, one, one of the board directors disappeared for 30 minutes off of the Zoom call. I don't know what was going on, but he popped up at the end. And I think that really just shows a real disrespect for process, public process. And I would hope that we could think of ways to um, do, that you guys can do your job better to serve the public. And certainly being present uh, once a month is not a big commitment. So I'd like, I'd, I'd like you to hear a different point of view on this. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, Stephen. Um, all right, so moving on to the uh, to Chief Officer Report and Activity Summary. Chief White. All right, thank you, and good evening again, everyone. <clears throat> um, I want to just cover a few uh, key items on my report. Um, but I won't go too deep in detail, and some of them as they are probably not of very much interest. But the Marine Wildfire Prevention Authority Board of Directors recently approved the executive staff's request to secure office space and meeting space. Um, there's a, this was a request that was placed as a result of 51 plus Brown Act meetings and multiple staff having to go off site to numerous locations to um, hold various meetings. And so, given the potential for confusion or conflict or, or um, uh, misunderstandings about where meetings will be held. They, they feel like this will be a more consistent practice and, and location to offer everyone a chance to go and park and uh, be present at, at a consistent location. So uh, my understanding after a couple of questions I posed um, was that the first one I wanted to know was there a lot of opposition to this and so why? And then the other question was, what is the market rate for the, um, the office space that is being sought? Because the expense was somewhere I think in the neighborhood of $125,000 a year. Um, but from what I'm told, the rental price for the space is um, substantially below market. And as such, it really made more sense to try to land on a consistent location as I indicated earlier. So with that, um, more of the meetings that are going to be held as the pandemic hopefully starts to subside at some point will be held probably at a centric location. I understand it's uh, called the Commons. I'm not very familiar with that location, but um, if any of you know where the Commons are, that's the name that I heard um, um, buzzing around as a potential location for the meeting. Vegetation management, um, approximately 20 acres of goat grazing has been completed, and I believe that really summarizes all the goat grazing that was scheduled to take place. Four plus acres were done off of Grasshopper Hill, and another nearly 16 acres were done off of Idleberry Road. And with that, um, the direct assistance program had been discussed previously, uh, where it offers uh, the ability for homeowners to improve defensible state space, utilizing the work and the assistance of the fire foundry crews. That work continues um, just next week as an example, they got, or excuse me, the week after next, pardon me, getting my statements confused. At the end of June into the first week in July, there were five additional homes that were provided with that assistance. And then there's another free direct assistance round scheduled to take place between July 25th and July 28th. And so that work is still continuing. Uh, and there's certainly an interest in trying to meet as many opportunities as we can provide assistance for. And so there was a, um, 
a couple of forms that I can uh, include in here. Did I make sure I got those forms so you just go around there? Yeah, they're in here. Okay, great. So those were the request forms and um, hopefully if you know of anyone that could use and benefit from Italian Cypress or some of the Juniper removal that, that crews have been responsible for doing, which can be fairly pricey, um, this would certainly be a great opportunity to share this information with community members who um, otherwise might need uh, some assistance with vegetation removal. So we're still accepting applicants. Please encourage anyone you know to apply ASAP though. Uh, moving on to chipper days. Um, there were some chipper days that were listed and they're actually contained in the link as well that's embedded in the report. And they've got um, some coming up next week, as a matter of fact, in another round of chipper days moving forward into October. In addition, um, the week of August 29th, Big Rock and Blackstone zones will receive chipper assistance. And so um, we don't have the full number of stats for all the chipper days and or the amount of chip material, but we're hoping to get that um, so that I can provide that in a future report and just give you an idea as to the scale of the amount of work that's been conducted and the amount of tonnage that's been removed um, from the various locations that have been benefited from receiving the chipper services. Um, <clears throat> happy to report that uh, as of the date of this report, when I submitted it, we had a total of 20 Marinewood Lucas Valley Road um, uh, grant applications. And so 11 of those have already been approved for roughly $9,500. And some of the other ones were um, still pending. There was some home hardening grants totaling $5,774, five vegetation grants, which were totaling $3,725. Um, and this is based on some of the resident and documented expenditures that were in excess of $13,000 towards vegetation management. The remaining uh, have pending statuses, as I mentioned, there were seven that needed supporting documentation. There's one being escalated to uh, vegetation management unit leadership for a further evaluation to see whether they um, qualify. And then one may not actually be um, approved because it may not meet the grant requirements that were outlined. And so that's you know one out of 20, hopefully that individual will have an opportunity to course correct or maybe find some alternative assistance that can help uh, achieve um, fuel reduction in, on their property. Uh, at the time of the report, quick uh, chip day question. Sure. Um, so, I, 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 I'm, if I understand, like, let's say I, like, I have a hill in my backyard. If I take some stuff down from my backyard, do I just drag it out to the street or do I have to contact the chipping service? How does that? I'm just like wanting to share this with my neighbors and trying to figure out the best way to have them take advantage of this to cut down on our fire fuel. I think if you're able to get it to the street side before the chipper days, that probably really helps the chipper crew because they can continue to get more done without having to go onto your property and, and try to remove it off site. But there are probably some instances where individuals need support and assistance doing just that. So I think they're probably working on a case by case basis, depending on what's being um, asked of them at that particular time. But we always encourage people to bring it street side if possible so that it's just a matter of, of pick up and go and load and go, if you will, and be able to move on to the next property. Because as you can imagine, if they have to go into every property and start removing and then bringing a street side and then doing the chipping, that just takes that much more time and it reduces their ability to, to flourish in what they're doing. So if you can, oh. we certainly encourage you to bring street side. Okay. And do, do people who take advantage of this, do we have to contact the, the service ahead of time so they don't come to our residence? Yes. And, okay. and again, there, there, there should be something that indicates. It's going to happen in your area, but you want to be um, in contact with them, advising them that you're available for, for the support as well. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chief. I appreciate it. No worries. Chris, you, that as well. Yeah, Chris, if you just go to the link that's uh, in the Chief's report there for the chipper days, uh, and you type in your address, it'll tell you exactly what day you reserve it. Uh, you reserve one of the slots for it, and then yes, the night before, you just bring it all down to the curb, and they uh, come through and during those days and chip it and haul it off. Perfect. But yes, you do need to reserve it so they know that's where to stop, and then they do cut it off once a certain number is hit because they only have so much time and allocation to be able to do it. Totally makes sense. Do we get that out to the public in a way that you know is that something that we put on the website? Is that or do we put signs up? Just seems like that would be something we want to let the neighborhood know. Yeah, we've definitely put out blasts and we put out information as well as uh, not only us but Santa their deputy emergency manager Quinn Gordon has put out a lot of information via next door, um, and then obviously all over the fire site, safe site uh, is all the information too. But we certainly try to push it out the best we can. Yeah, I encourage others to also look at fire safe Marin in case they're adding additional chipper days as well. There may be updated information there that um, could surface about additional chipper days that could be scheduled. Great, thank you. You're welcome. So uh, the Waldorf School concern was brought to my attention a while back, and I ensured that one of our vegetation management uh, unit specialists went out to do a site visit and discuss concerns with the um, the, the individuals who were represented those other property. And so given that, um, they're still working with the, the actual school um, staff there to address the concerns. They didn't particularly see the bundles that were, were brought to my attention as a significant concern. I did share with them in the event that that pile is not decomposing, but yet it's dry and something were to happen and ignited, it could become a, um, should we say, really ignitable and easy spread fuel. But from their inspection, they didn't see a significant issue, but they're gonna provide me with more information and updates on this for our next report coming up next month. So I just wanna give you an update that that is being looked into. COVID-19, uh, wow, I, I hope I wouldn't be reporting on COVID you know, at this point. Um, unfortunately, there's still some significant challenges in, in our communities with COVID and within our state, if not the entire country. And so, um, you know, those challenges range from, you know, what's going on here locally to what's ha happening statewide and uh, what's happening also with some of our, our military and first responders. And so this, I saw some interesting information about the Army, Army National Guard and about 13,000 of the forces had not been vaccinated, which equated to roughly 40,000 individuals. And because of them, um, there's about 14,000 of those who outright just refused and offer up a request for an accommodation or an exemption for uh, medical or religious reasons. And they may be forced out of the service. Um, and their deadline was to, uh, June 30th to basically comply. So it's gonna be interesting to see um, what happens, but the, the number of individuals um, ranges between 20 to 30% of the guard members in six states who are also not vaccinated and 10 more percent in 43 other states still need shots. And so um, only 7,000 out of the 40,000 have sought exemption. I don't know where they're gonna land on that, but the army by contrast has 99% of the, the members in the service vaccinated with 1% not being vaccinated or fewer than 1% at this point. So um, it was uh, interesting to note that in all the one state, New Jersey, the army national guard soldiers are actually vaccinated at a higher rate than the general population in the state. And so while these numbers were important to notice, it just kind of speaks to the situation that we're facing right now as a, a country in general, where not everybody's on the same page regarding vaccination. And this is continuing to become a ongoing concern for us as the subvariants continue to surface and create new infections. Um, so at the time of the report, the vaccinations uh, were authorized by the FDA for emergency authorization for children that were aged um, six months to five years. And that in and of itself is a relief to a lot of parents who have been waiting to get their toddler's vaccination. Um, but there were some concerns about myocarditis being something that they thought or worried, parents thought or worried might be something that children could be impacted by, by taking the vaccination. But from what I understand, it's just the opposite, is that the vaccination will help prevent myocarditis, which is caused or one of the, the uh, signs or symptoms rather of being infected with COVID. And so um, it's a tough call to make. Do I,
and how it's still, you know, moving the way it is, I think vaccination still makes the most sense. I understand there's also a lot of them targeting with the newer vaccines that are coming out to target the variants and the subvariants in a way that the original vaccines weren't designed to do. So um, with that, there's a, a a lot of effort underway with Pfizer, Moderna, and others to, to try to ensure that they're providing something that's effective for the younger kids as well as the adults as they move forward with potential future boosters. Um, so more information will follow on that. But I guess the last thing I will share about this is the COVID infection rates uh, for the county and for the region in general are at a severe point at this point in time. If you were to look at the rate, the way we use the rate infections based on color coding, we'd actually be in the highest rate right now where they were looking at continued social dis distancing. They would consider us the need to continue to mask, to continue to do all those things that we've been doing early on in the pandemic. Um, those things aren't being communicated everywhere, but mask use seems to still be a prudent thing to do to reduce infection and or exposure. So um, although we're not seeing a lot of mandates right now, I'm, I'm suspecting that depending on what happens over the next several weeks, if the numbers continue to rise the way they have, mask mandates could be something that are revisited, um, even as unpopular as they may be, just to ensure that they control the infection rates to some degree, or at least uh, do something to prevent them from continuing to escalate. So more on that will follow. Fire incidents. Uh, we had a small grass fire on Mount Shasta Road and, <coughs> excuse me, Lucas Valley Road. And so if you look at the photographs, it's a roadside incident that took place. A crew got out there pretty quickly and, and were able to contain the incident to roughly about an eighth of an acre. Uh, the unusual thing about this is there's a stump grinder that's right in the vicinity there, uh, and no one was there near the stump grinder to claim ownership over what occurred, but the stump grinder was partially melted, which kind of gives you a clue that maybe this stump grinder had been abandoned while it was still hot, uh, and somehow or another ignited the grass in that area. So fortunately, our crews um, got there pretty quickly. It was a slow rate of spread because of the work that had already been done in the area. Um, but that being said, our crews got out and did everything they could to, to mitigate this and stop it from threatening some of the other structures that were in the immediate area. Um, the McFit team, Marine County Fire Investigation team, is still supposed to be investigating this, but I think we have a smoking gun, if you will, um, given what happened. So I don't know how much investigation they're putting into it, except maybe trying to figure out who owned the, the device. But um, outside of that, uh, they had to go back a couple of times without hotspots. And that's a concern because if you can't extinguish something like this effectively, and then the wind kicks up, it can carry some of these um, burnt embers and other things into nearby vegetation or even distant vegetation and create an issue. So we were back out a couple of times to address the hotspots. Um, I saw something interesting the other day on television that I think has a lot of utility. And I saw it in a remote area. So this made me think, why haven't we thought about this before? They have what looked like lawn sprinklers that you might find at a park somewhere out in a forested area where it had been burned. And it was over there just actually spraying water to probably do just what I was uh, trying to um, describe here, which was prevent rekindle or reignition. And I'm assuming they're using some sort of portable or lengthy um, connection to a static source. Otherwise, they'd be you know, um, having to tap into a substantial amount of water to do this. But something like this seems to have value. I wonder if we could set up a portable operation where we just use one of the back and forth um, easily purchased at Home Depot or other location to actually just continue to spray water in that location so our crews don't have to stay on site and can be available for other emergencies. So that's something I'm going to give some consideration and thought to on how we could do something just like this effectively, but something that makes sense and can operate for at least an hour or two soaking down an area independently without having to be monitored. So more to follow on that. Um, but again, this incident combined with what I saw on the news recently is what kind of prompted me to think about. Maybe we got an option we need to consider. Last but not least, um, the numbers. Wow, very close to looking like numbers I always see, but they're still slightly different, but they're still sub five minutes, 30 seconds. Uh, Still amazing, still a great uh, indication of our crews knowing their district, knowing how to get out the door quickly and get on scene quickly. Five minutes, 26 seconds. I'll put that up against anybody. I think I've said that to you before. I'll put that up against any agency, um, unless it's a agency that's only two square blocks. You know, that's all I got. <laughs> but in this case, our personnel are getting out and getting on scene quickly. And so I just, I have to always show my appreciation for that because that to me is the, the cornerstone of what the fire service does. We get out and get on scene quickly to make a difference as best we can quickly. And when you have people to do this consistently over and over again, you don't even have to remind them. You don't have to discuss turnout or turbo response times with them at any point. That means they're, they're, they're dialed in in a way that a lot of agencies would, would benefit from seeing and learning from. So. I'm going to always encourage them to continue to do their best, but I just want you to know that you are actually working and, and um, being assisted by some of the best I've seen in the business. So that's uh, the summary of my report, and I'm available for any questions. I hope I have answers for. Thanks, Chief. Any, uh, any questions from the board? No? All right. Any anything from the public? There are no hands raised, Lisa. Um, I would say uh, just to answer Chief's question from the beginning of this report, Marin Commons is actually 1,600 Los Gamos. So it's uh, just down the road. It's the same place where OES, uh, where Santa Fe Fire used to have their administrative offices. Uh, that's a fancy name that nobody calls it. Is it where the sheriff, for some reason, I was thinking of Commons being somewhere like in Larkspur or somewhere in that direction. I don't know why I didn't place it with right where I used to be. That's strange. Wow. Because the office is right down the street. Yeah. Because they took the sign down and put up Kaiser Permanente. Uh, okay. <laughs> it used to say okay. Grand Commons. That'll make it very convenient for us to go and uh, visit, huh? Yes. <laughs> oh, well, very good. Well, that, again, Chief, thank you very much. Thank you. Absolutely. I hope your daughter's feeling better. Last time you said she had just come down with COVID, so I'm hoping she's feeling better. Yeah, she, she's doing a lot better. She's got a lot of attitude now and everything that she used to have pre-COVID. So, um, <laughs> yeah, she's doing great. <laughs> But thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you maybe you should get vaccinated this time. You know, I thought that would be the case. And I even tried to make the argument that, you know, you've got COVID and being vaccinated. They say you have even more protection than the average person. And it fell on deaf ears. That's probably oh. the best way to put it. So, yeah. Sorry. She that, that doesn't know best in this case, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> she got her roll back. Did she roll her eyes to you, too? Um, I, I get more back talking and crazy text messages than I get the roll back. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Um, yeah, and one of them woke me up late last night. And I was pretty irritated about that. You know, you could have waited until the morning for that one. But just had to come back at something I had to say, right? So, yep. And have okay. a lot of time, right? Welcome to Chris's world as a world as a middle school teacher. Oh. <laughs> I got the there's a spider in my room. Can you come kill it? Why were you up? Oh, I can see the spider. I still, get, I still get that one and they're 17 and 18. So okay. <laughs> what do you do if I'm not here today? You know, so <laughs> yep, I still get it. Yeah. Well, thank you for everything you do. Thank you all as well. I appreciate it. You guys have a great night. We'll see you soon. You too. Have a good night. Take care. All right. So then moving on to park and recreation matters. Draft minutes at Park and Recreation Commission meeting. What, Director Case? I just want to say thank you to Kathleen. I was uh, <laughs> I, I was I guess I think I was out of town. I don't know. The summer is a very sketchy time for me. I'm rarely home. If anybody wants to uh,
yeah. Still needs planning oh. uh, documents for uh, Park and Rec that was shared with the board at the last meeting. Yeah, um, and then, oh. That's about it. The other thing that was brought up was the um, center dividers all along Miller Creek and the one that was right actually in, close to your house, Chris. Um, and basically we informed them to write the county because it's not Marinwood land that it's really, we need to, if you, if you want the medians done that besides the ones that we already maintain because they're in front of the community center to write the county, so. Given that, I kind of noticed that um, the median had like that one crosswalk that I'm always nervous I'm gonna hit somebody. I'm um, kind of closer to pathway. Yeah, it's, it's worth talking. It's by Joe's house, but I don't know the address is there. Um, yeah. Like, is there a way that we, as, as an elected group, can can put some pressure on the county to do something there? So I, informal. I had asked Eric about this. Like, we're all apparently sharing brainwaves because I had asked Eric about this. Was it two weeks ago, Eric? Three uh, weeks ago, possibly. And I had just done a drive out to Fairfax, and I really enjoyed San Anselmo, and I really enjoyed their medians. And I was like, Eric, who do we need to talk to to get this going? So I think that we all agree that as a board, we should call the county. And see what we can do because it's the county, as Eric said. But Eric, I'll let you talk. But I just want to let you know, three moves. Well, can you also add the eucalyptus tree to that conversation? Yeah, I think that all of I think what I was thinking was the whole, all of those could be done in a way that were fire prevention and also be beautiful. Because if you look at what they've done in San Anselmo, because they have a fire issue out there too, especially with their one way in and one way out, just like us, they have some really cool rock stuff that's going on, and then they do California natives that are hardy for um, fire. So right, I, I think San Anselmo is its own city. Exactly, that's what Eric said to me. So we're going to have to reach out. I know we're going to have to reach out to the county and see if, as a board, we could possibly take this on and see if there's a way that we can through fire mitigation or some other forms of grants and possibly also our own funding to try to spruce that up and make it look and also function better so that we don't, we're not afraid we're going to hit people because the pathways are being blocked or things are going to explode in fire because of the eucalyptus trees. And it just kind of goes with how the changing of our, own, our whole neighborhood and with the property values and everybody, you know, wanting things to look a little bit nicer now. So I don't disagree with you, but I do don't, I don't feel like this is something that the CSD should be taking on with the lack of manpower that we have to control to maintain it, number one. And number two, the issues that we already have with our maintenance crew every three months getting a new manager that Luke has to go walk through to just get our walkways maintained. So I think that it's not just taking it on and it's a quick project. It's a big project. That well, no, I know it's gonna be a big project and it's nothing. I was hoping that we could possibly do it in a way that it would be more lower maintenance and on top of it that we could work with the county to possibly work with us on this. And when I'm saying that as a board, I don't think that this necessarily has will be a CSD issue that we have to do. I think that we should reach out as a CSD, but then as individual board members and everybody, we should all push for more pressure on the county and maybe if there's enough squeaky wheels, they'll address it since Eric says that this has been, I'm gonna stop talking and say what Eric says, but I'm let Eric talk. But from what I understand, this has been a question that he's brought up to the county and other people brought up. For many, many years, for many yeah. years. Many years, many people, and it's always seemed to fall on deaf ears, just like when they went to the eucalyptus trees, uh, even if you wipe, you know, bring from five perspective deaf ears. Uh, I would say, yeah, your best, my, my best advice is just to reach out to DPW, maybe even the DPW director, technically it falls under the roads division. Um, and I think that it's fine to uh, identify yourself as this and you're sharing a community concern that has come to the district, but uh, you know, keeping in mind that, that the roadways are not within the district jurisdiction. So as far as having a formal stance from the district goes. Yeah. I would like to chime in on this one. I think that uh, we could inform our illustrious local board member of the supervisors. I believe it's still Damon Connolly. Maybe he's exactly. pull, 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 well, she's not yet. It doesn't happen until yeah, it's uh, November. December. So Damon's still the supervisor. So if he could maybe utilizing the same effort he dragged our maintenance facility into county, maybe he could put some weight towards the uh, Department of Public Works. Just a suggestion. I like it. Yeah. Very good. All right. Anything else from the board on deafness? All right. Anything from the public? One second, please. <clears throat> Stephen. Uh, yeah, I would just like to second what uh, Bill Shea suggested. Damon Connolly and uh, Mary are, are both really customer service oriented, and I'm sure uh, they would welcome the call from. Oh, Stephen, I don't hear you. Yeah. Maybe maybe some peer question again, like you said, it was having issues. Right. Should we move on? Can we let him say his thing when he gets back on? Yeah, yeah, Stephen, we can come back to you. Um, all right, any um, other public comments? Seeing none, we can move to um, recreation and park maintenance activity reports. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm just going to hit a couple highlights on my report. I'm just going to update on kind of how the summer's going. Um, camps have been going great. Um, we're uh, in our fifth session right now. And um, uh, kind of piggybacking on what Chief White was talking about, uh, we have had a lot more COVID cases in our camps than we were expecting after running camps the last two years. But thankfully, we have not seen COVID uh, spreading through individual camp groups. They seem to be these one-offs um, each week. Different, you know, different camps are getting hit, different staff members. And we have not seen anything kind of spreading through one of our um, individual camp groups, which is, which is good. We've been able to continue to, to keep every uh, camp group running. And it's just been um, a handful of cases kind of throughout the weeks, but, but more, than, more than we were expecting for sure, um, both with, with uh, the camps and the staff. But um, thankfully, uh, things are running really smoothly in spite of that. And um, it's been great to be back to a normal summer. We've um, had a return to offering field trips every other week for our oldest three age groups. And uh, we've had two so far, and those have been going great. And we've got another one um, tomorrow. We're going to the Oakland Zoo. So um, that should be really fun for those kids. Uh, we've brought back uh, offering special presenters and special events for the camps. We've had uh, DJ dance parties and we've had like a petting, petting zoo. The, the reptile guy was here and a bunch of fun uh, special things for the, for the different camps, which has been really great to be able to reintroduce that after a couple years off. Um, the kids, have, I've got two kids in camp this year. I know Eric's got a couple and a bunch of you have some too. Um, that's been great just to see that some of the dress 
uh, stuff days and some of the special things of making homes ranting and breathing every day. So that's been um, a really nice return to, to normalcy uh, from that end. Um, in spite of we've got a few headaches trying to fill uh, vacancies as we got some staff out sick and trying to juggle the schedule has been more challenging than, than a normal year. Um, but uh, thankfully, Robin has been doing a great job with and her supervisor staff, just filling the gaps and shuffling people around as needed and making sure everyone has the supervision that they need. So that's been going really well and, and we're feeling good as we go into um, kind of the halfway point or just across the halfway point for summer um, that uh, we'll continue to have a good summer moving forward. So, um, the pool season is also going really well. We, we did some tweaks to the schedule this year to try to um, better accommodate our, our, our different user groups. And while that's been a little bit of an adjustment um, to just make sure we're getting, we're getting used to, it seems to be serving um, everyone really well. The swim lessons have been uh, going really strong. We've, we've been virtually full all summer. Um, we've been giving uh, more more time for uh, the, the camp kids as well as for our adult lap swimmers. And that all seems to be working out really well. Got a lot of positive feedback from all of our different user groups. And um, I think our pool rentals, which mostly take place on the weekends, we, we offer two different spots for people to rent out for pool parties um, during our recreation swim hours. Um, those have been uh, seemingly full uh, every time slide almost every weekend. So um, it seems like people are just back at the pool in full force. The weather has helped. It's been you know, the last couple of weeks, we've had some, some 90 plus degree days. And um, so uh, it's been just uh, good to see people feeling comfortable coming back into the pool and we've been able to accommodate the crowds. Um, I, got, I got quoted at a story this weekend from IJ. Uh, they're doing a story on, on a lifeguard a shortage in the Bay Area. Um, it's really a national lifeguard shortage. It's been going on for a long time, but they were focusing kind of on the acute shortage from the um, post or current COVID uh, years. And um, I just, uh, that article was, was short, but it was, it was good and it made me um, feel, I've mentioned it before, but I just want to, I'm very grateful that we've actually been able to staff our pool programs. And I just want to give another uh, kind of shout out to John Paul, who oversees the pool for us, um, for being able to uh, hire and, and keep enough staff on the schedule to run everything. And um, he's doing a great job with that. I know a lot of our neighboring pools are really suffering with staffing shortages. And we are as well. It's, it's, been, it's definitely been tricky, but um, we, we've been able to maintain our schedule and, and keep all of our programs running. And, and um, it's been more challenging this year, but we've been able to do it. And I know that that's important. It's a little bit of luck, a little bit of our, um, our process and, and our feeder programs and the way we operate. Um, but also, John Paul's done a great job of recruiting and um, keeping people on staff uh, that, that they've had other options. So, um, we're hoping that that stays the case through the rest of the summer and through the fall. But um, in the meantime, I'm happy that, that we're open and things are going okay with the pool. Um, the other the main thing, um, just in terms of our special events, we've now had two Music in the Park installments this summer, and both of them have been uh, really wonderfully uh, executed and attended. Uh, two great bands, or I guess three, but two the first, the first installment we had one uh, this last week. Pamela Parker performed on Friday, um, and she had a, a great band. Um, we had a little bit smaller turnout this summer, I think a lot of people were out of town, it's a little bit of a cooler night, but a great event, um, and I think everyone had a really good time. And we've got two more Music in the Park Friday nights uh, coming up, and then in the middle, uh, this two weeks from tomorrow, or two weeks from Saturday, or one week from Saturday, is our uh, Summer Brew Fest, which will be taking place on Saturday, the 23rd, from 3 to 7, and we're really excited about that. We'll also have live music, um, as well as some uh, breweries doing beer tasting, and we'll have um, some food, so that'll be a fun event. I'll yeah, putting some more details out um, online through our marketing channels about that, but that's going to be a really great event. I hope some of you are able to make it to that. Um, but that's our next special event, and then the Music in the Park series will continue after that. Um, and then this our staff, we're trying to work on our fall programming. Uh, it's very challenging to try to plan for the fall and winter while we're in the middle of uh, the summer chaos, but um, staff have been putting together the schedules for our, um, our adult classes and our youth classes and different programs that will be taking place this fall and winter, and we're hoping to have um, our schedule of programs out uh, towards the end of the summer. So I'll update everyone on that probably at the next meeting, but um, they're, they're working hard at that, and that's coming together. On the parks maintenance side of things, the staff have been working uh, hard out at Creekside Park. Um, we've been doing uh, some changing up the landscaping out there, refreshing things, fixing some, some retaining walls, um, taking out some, some dead shrubs, and uh, just doing a lot of pruning and sprucing up. It's looking really good. We have um, a little bit more to do out there, but it's going to look really nice when, when everything's said and done. Um, we also have some tree work done out there to um, trim up the, the big uh, oak tree out there to take out some, some limbs that need to trimming and um, kind of clean up some of the other trees in the area. And it's starting to really come together. So um, if you guys have a chance, I wouldn't go out just yet, but um, in a few weeks' time, make your way up to Creekside and see a lot of the improvements that are going on out there. It's looking really nice, and staff have been working really hard at that. Um, we also had a, a big tree, kind of a, a giant branch from a tree, fall down in the open space out at uh, Union Stone, behind Union Stone Lane, um, landed on a residence property, but thankfully didn't damage any property, didn't damage any structures or any people. Um, but it was a very large branch, and I was supposed to get uh, taken care of last Friday, but it's not going to be taking place this Thursday. We got a tree crew going out to clean that up, um, which is good. And um, uh, and then just one thing that happened last week, we, we discovered a, a, a leak in the main park in the irrigation. Uh, but the crew was able to discover that and tackle that and get it all worked in, a, in about three, in less than three days, which is which is pretty quick. Um, and it's uh, they were digging a big hole in the park right during summer camp, which is not ideal. Um, it's also not ideal to have the um, the water off in the middle of hot days in the summer. But thankfully, the weather was mild enough; they were able to get it up and working. Um, but the, the turf was not uh, did not suffer too much during that. So um, I think thanks to the crew for, for being on top of that, for working super quickly and for staying out of the way of the camps. No one uh, no one fell in the hole, and, uh, and everything's kind of back back to normal. So um, that's all I wanted to touch on uh, for for Parks and Rec. Please let me know if you'd like me to uh, discuss anything. If you have any questions, thank you. No questions, but I have to say, I mean, I am I continue to be so impressed by your staff and with, with the with the summer camps. First of all, I mean, I, I keep hearing and from my own kids and others just how wonderful that's going, as well as the swim lessons. Um, and you know, you, I know there's been challenges with staffing and the like, but you you never be, would be able to tell. So I think that's a testament to, to the people on your team, Luke. So really appreciate that. Um, additionally, the um, the work that that, uh, that the team's been doing on the on the Creekside Park, um, I walk by it every day, and I can see that it's, it's a big operation. Um, it, it's I can tell that a lot of work is, is going into that, and I know it'll be beautiful um, as it continues to develop. So appreciate that as well. Um, so that's all I had to say. Uh, okay, so appreciate that. Yeah, um, and I see Bill's got his hand up. Hey, Luke, I, <clears throat> do you know about there's a tree that broke off uh, just down from the horseshoe pits adjacent to the uh, the new facility, uh, and it fell nicely right into the creek. Did you know about that tree? Yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, yeah, I, I was really aware of that. Uh, I think we, we saw that the next the next day. Um, that whole that whole drainage ditch. I'm working on bringing some people out from uh, that have helped us out with
Right, right. No, I don't mean that that tree was a, a result of erosion. That tree was, I think, just uh, rotted out and, and fell. But that whole that whole area ne uh, next to the horseshoe pits is an area that um, does need to be addressed. I think there, we have seen a lot of erosion in there. The um, the water has been cutting pretty deep, a pretty deep canyon down there. And um, I'm working on a project to kind of get a lot of of uh, the brush and everything in there cleared out, including including that tree that, that fell. But uh, um, I because of the water that's going through there and the, the proximity to not only our, our horseshoe pits, you know, one of our big assets, uh, as well as the, the tennis courts right there, um, I'm, I'm asking some of our uh, our friends over there that, that help with you know giving us some, some leadership and direction on that to give us some guidance on exactly what the best approach is to preserve those areas on either side and um, before we go in and tackle to to uh, red walls. Um, so now we'll, yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll see. But anyway, so that, that's on our radar, but um, we're, we're definitely working with them to, to give us, you know, kind of the best practice for what to do with the police. Yeah. Yeah, okay. you know, some, sometimes the best thing is to actually let some of the brush stay. fall more on the bottom and stay. It's, it's not always the best practice to take everything out that's, that's dead or spawn. Yeah. So um, I'm still uh, waiting for some more visits from, from some of those individuals, um, but we'll, we'll be doing some work on that probably most likely this fall to kind of uh, clean up that area strategically. Okay. Yeah. And we still are a staff of three, so it um, hasn't run away yet? No, we are a staff of, of three, and we've got some part-time help as well. Yay! It's, it's amazing seeing all the kids in the pool and just you guys managing to do everything, and again, as you said, I've seen you guys keep that pool open even for early morning laps and even when the high schoolers were not available. And um, it's a big effort. And I just wanted to, again, say thank you to you and JP and everybody else. Sorry, I had a sneeze. And I did manage to mute it though, didn't I? Um, <laughs> so just thank you. And the uh, music in the park was amazing. And um, even the first one that we had back, um, lots of people from all around the community were there. So it's wonderful to see. Oh, thanks a lot. And I would just reiterate those comments as a guy who sees the pool operation from a little different vantage point than most. Um, it's really impressive. And I've been around a lot of pools my entire life. And this is one that you guys should all feel very safe having your children not only learn uh, how to swim, but when they start going down there by themselves, they're in the, I would argue, the safest pool that I've ever been around. That's very nice of you to say, Chris. Appreciate that. Should we open it up? I think Stephen managed to get back on. Is that Stephen who's got his hand raised? So, is there any any other questions, comments from the board? No. I would like to say and again, reiterate to everybody on staff, but also Eric too, for the hours that you put into. Because I know in this time, we really do thank our staff and Luke and everyone else. But Eric, you do a tremendous amount of work and really support all our staff members as well. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's it. So then, moving on to public comment. One second. Stephen, how how are we doing? Do you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Okay, great. So I just I'm going to backtrack. Um, to the agenda. Uh, first of all, I, I agree with Bill Shea. Uh, definitely call on Damon Connolly and Mary Sackett. They're both very committed to communities. And this is uh, the issue uh, that you want to get resolved is just exactly the kind of issue that they will uh, get in and, and help us with. So uh, anyhow, someone should, should formally uh, contact his office to get uh, uh, the work done. Secondly, on the agenda, uh, there was one thing on the agenda that was missing. And I brought up the issue, again, of alcohol use in our park, um, pointing out the fa fact uh, that not only is it illegal uh, according to our own bylaws, uh, to have uh, alcohol in the park uh, for non-permitted, uh, uh, without a permit. It's also uh, against uh, the ordinance, the Marin County uh, ordinance. And so um, I, I hate to be a blue nose about this, but honestly, it's out of control. And uh, we, I don't know if you're aware, uh, Marin County is has some of the highest rates of alcoholism anywhere in California. It's an issue. And uh, underage drinking is an issue. And so uh, I think there are smart ways to address it. Um, I know Kathleen, uh, unfortunately, I, I'm just maybe not communicating well with Kathleen, but she uh, thought that I was asking her to personally get involved with it. I'm not. I'm thinking that we can uh, set up a policy uh, and just make things clear to people, uh, our expectations of behavior in the park. Um, I want to compliment Luke once again. I think the work that his staff does is most, among the most important work that we do here. Um, we create community. We build lives, build character. We help our children out. We, uh, I mean, all, all the work he does is so very, very important, and I, I appreciate every little bit of it. Um, and that, the other thing I wanted to talk about, I don't know if, it's, if now is a good time to talk about it. Uh, Maybe uh, at the end of the meeting, it's better uh, time to talk, but I also wanted to thank the board in general for the way that you conduct your meetings and contrasting that with uh, some of the things that happened at the last meeting. I'll, I'll wait to make that comment later, but uh, uh, anyhow, that's it for now. Thank you, Stephen. Um, actually, I, have, I, I think Stephen brings up a, an interesting topic, but do we, I'm assuming that we have a, a license to sell alcohol in the park when we have events like music in the park or yeah, that's that's correct. So for any of our um, Marinewood sponsored events that we put on where we sell alcohol, we do get um, a daily license to sell from the Department of Alcohol and Beverage Control. And that's why we have the flags. Uh, the flags around the music park event are part of our yeah part of our effort to um, just control where alcohol is you know taking place and making sure people don't leave the premises. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't I don't drink at the music park, um, but I, and I see plenty of people who aren't drinking, so um, it looks pretty orderly to me. But okay. I don't I don't think he's addressing and Stephen, you can chime in next time you get unmuted. But I don't think he's his issue is the music in the park and whether we're legal or not. His issue is when it's being rented out by the public or the horseshoe pit. So there is, correct me if I'm wrong, Eric, but when you rent that barbecue area, there is a rule and there's signs all over the pool and everywhere that say that you cannot have alcohol on the premises, but it is not the, I believe, I know that it is not a board because I just went through our training, that it is not a board position for me to regulate that if I am walking through the park. It really should be on the sheriff. The sheriff should be called if there's a violation of those or, those rules. It should not be staff or the board. So that's where I hear that you, I hear you, Stephen, when you say there is an issue, but it really should be addressed by the sheriff at that point. So. I appreciate that clarification, Kathleen. I think that's similar to like an unleashed dog, right? Um, many, many of our park areas, dogs are supposed to be only on leash, and yet there's there's a prevalence of unleashed dogs in the places where dogs are supposed to be leashed, and therefore the, it's on the person who may feel imperiled to contact the sheriff uh, directly about you know that unleashed dog and its owner. I'm just just providing a parallel, I, I'm, as far as I understand. Okay. 
them. Appreciate that. Thank it's, you. It's an enforcement issue, one way or the other. Got it. All right. Well, appreciate the clarification. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, then I guess we, that brings us to item H. Board members, items of interest, request for future agenda items. Just an update on the facility in terms of our move-in dates and then also the area around and what the status is on that. And then possibly um, if you can hear before we do about if they're going to manage to build the bridge for us moving forward with trying to get grants for the pathway. Keep you informed. Thank you. Um, I would have a, a just a, a request, and it doesn't need to be next meeting or next, the meeting after, but as, we, as we're moving into fire season, um, I'm interested to know what progress we've made, if any, about the cell coverage in uh, in the, the spotty areas of cell coverage um, in, in our community. No, I still don't have to spotty, so. Neither do I. <laughs> so apparently we haven't gotten anywhere. <laughs> Right, right. But I mean, it's, it, there's a lot that is that goes into it, and I, I've seen I've seen a bit of it. So um, anyway, it's just a request. If you stand in the garden at Lucas Valley where the chickens are, I can send texts. So just you, if you need to send texts, you can send them there. The place where the bad signal comes through. Yes, the chicken signal. The chicken signal. <laughs> All right. Any others? None. All right. Um, anything from the public? One second. Hi. Uh, boy, it makes it hard to have a conversation and clarify if I don't get put back into the conversation. Um, I n at no point was I ever uh, suggesting that any board member uh, be in charge of telling people they can't drink. I do think as leaders, you can say, hey, these are our expectations. Um, actually, I think uh, a good way to resolve something like this is to have, uh, you know, just a couple kids uh, that are basically, you might want to call them security, you might want to call them concierge, you know, park, you know, you know, uh, people that, that help around the park. Um, and they would have duties like making sure uh, rules are being followed, the reservations are uh, being um, uh, taken care of, and um, just overseeing activities in the park. They would carry a, um, a, a, a cell phone or something to contact the police if necessary. At no point would they be um, in, expected to enforce laws, but they would just be there as a kind of friendly face of, you know, guest services, if you will. Um, I don't think we should look the other way on this. You know, the, the reason the horseshoe pit uh, has my ire is because you have to walk right through the crowd there. Um, and, and I don't mind doing it. I drink. I, I'm not I, I'm not opposed to drinking. But, I, but you know, there are people that have problems with alcohol, their children. And um, quite frankly, we have rules against this. And let's let's make sure that our rules get followed. Um, to compare it to dogs off leash, I guess, is OK, because uh, dogs could create problems of their own. But but um, I think uh, I, I think being friendly means all user groups uh, have an equal equal say in what's going on in our park. And we do have guidelines of behavior. And let's make sure that people are following them. Um, I did want to say one thing about the board. Um, the board, I think, has conducted itself really well. The last meeting, um, I was subject to repeated personal attacks. Um, and it was really kind of disgusting. But it also gives you an idea of how the board meetings used to go. And I would hope that in the future, should personal attacks like that occur, that the conversation would immediately be shut down and the person be reprimanded on the spot and don't allow that behavior. Don't accept it from any one of us, including me, uh, if we get off, that far off base. Um, am I, did you shut me off? No. Oh, okay. No, so I'm anyhow, I, I, like I said, I, I thank everybody. I, I actually think we're all kind of on the same pages of things. Um, uh, we all want a better park. We all want a better community. And there's no reason why we can't do that. Um, it's just a matter of faith and trust in each other. Thanks. Thanks, Stephen. All right, well, with that, um, we move to adjourn. I motion to adjourn. I'll second. All right, well then, call this meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Bye, guys. Good to see you. Good night. Welcome back, Chris. Thank you.